the first question. Dear Achan, may I know, did I understand the meaning of a meal dana correctly? Meal dana is to show our appreciation and support to the Mahasangha community by providing them with the four requisites. And also it's a good time to learn to be generous and let go of greed. Even though the food or items that is offered to the Achan, one shouldn't cling on to the thought that I hope Achan will like it or find it useful, etc. Isn't it? It's like one has to give freely and unconditionally. The giving process is empty and the recipient is also empty in a way. Yep, that sounds like a good summary of it, the whole thing. Um, there's obviously many, many different advantages of practicing dana, and especially with sangha, supporting sangha. Sangha is one of the three refuges, and since the time of the Buddha, there have been Buddhist monks and nuns and upasakas, parsikas, practicing in monasteries, monastic situations that need supporting because maybe in a monastery you're not earning any money, you literally have no food. You know, monks cannot store, buy food, store food, cook food. So we have to wait until uh, we come across people willing to share food and we're not even allowed to ask for food. We have to wait until they offer it. So Buddhists get to know that. And so you know, to save the monk time and out of compassion and faith, they bring food to monks or when they see monks, they'll offer food. And it's a way to get nearer to the Sangha, get the good example, see the good example of the Sangha, hear the teachings. And as you say, also expression of gratitude. You, know, you like Sangha, you want Sangha in the world, so you want to support them with material requisites. And as you say, it's for your own benefit to abandon some of your attachment, your stinginess. And so the best dana is given unconditionally without any kind of expectation. You've got to enjoy it to the monk, for example. That, you know, you're not expecting them necessarily to like it, enjoy it, keep it. The good karma and the attachment is made and the attachment is abandoned in the giving what happens afterwards is not totally irrelevant because you know you learn from dana and sometimes people offer something that's not so useful maybe and they notice that and then next time they adjust what they offer perhaps um so you can learn a little bit after the effect but your aim is not to offer with any kind of attachment so you know it does happen people say with food for example, they, it has happened before. I've seen people, they've got food in their hands and they offer to the monk, you know, they put their hands forward and then they're holding on to the thing they're offering. They're not yet releasing it to the monk for various reasons. So one may be that they want to make the monk, sure the monk puts that food in their bowl, in the monk's bowl. And so there's a certain directing of the food offering. It's not just offer to the monk and then let's see what happens. It's like that food has to go in his bowl. So there's a, that's clearly, it, it's not unconditional offering, it's conditional. There's an attachment there and then there's going to be suffering. So if the food doesn't go in the bowl of the monk, you know, the monk decides he doesn't need that food or want that food for some reason. And who knows what the monk is thinking? The monk may be thinking this is really great food the best food I like, therefore I'm not going to eat it because it's. I don't want to give in to my desire. Maybe you have to accept that. Some monks will pass on good food because they are letting go of desire. Or maybe they're practicing compassion. They say, well, this is really nice food. I'll let my friend eat it rather than take it myself. That also happens. So there's a number of different reasons a monk may decline to put a bit of food in the bowl or a particular requisite that is offered, he may decline to use it. It's not simply that he doesn't like you or he doesn't like the requisite. It may be other reasons that he wants to share with someone else, let go of some of his own attachment, and you have to accept 
you don't yet know what the monk is up to and what his intention is. And maybe you have to trust in that. But generally, you've got the right attitude. We give unconditionally. We're letting go of our own attachment. And so Ajahn Chah used to say, you know, the giving that hurts you a bit, meaning hurts the sense of self and attachment, is often quite good giving. So, you know, you give something you really uh, like yourself and you don't want to give it away, but you make yourself give it away. Often that's quite good because it really is reducing some of your possessiveness, your identification with that item or that um, could even be knowledge couldn't it sometimes we give away knowledge but sometimes people are stingy with their knowledge or stingy with their money stingy with their food stingy with something and it can be useful to practice giving away that which we really cling to teach ourselves a lesson <laughs> sadhu lumpo We have a raised hand. You may ask your question. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, am I audible? I can hear you, yeah. Uh, Ajahn, uh, I am Pupul, calling from uh, Maldives. Uh, one of my relatives recently, he was in hospital. Uh, Actually, he was suffering from lung, uh, lung issue, and doctor said that uh, that's his last time. And he was suffering so much when I'm reaching to the hospital. And he was like, uh, I felt that he was going to die. So I started chanting Paritas, and I continued for like uh, so many hours. And I uh, then he was telling so many things. I noticed that his mind was uh, conscious enough and uh, he was telling so many things then I asked him to uh, when you inhale say Buddha, Buddha then he start uh, telling Buddha, Buddha then uh, suddenly actually uh, from that point onward uh, he was uh, he was getting okay and doctors also following they told me that it is a miracle uh, this cannot be happened. Then uh, after like five days, he was dis discharged. And uh, yesterday, uh, one person went there and had a discussion with the patient. Still, he is uh, getting cured, but he is not fully 100% okay. But he has told that uh, sometime at the hospital, uh, some beans were taking him to a place, to a dark place. He can memorize some kind of visual uh, visual things. Uh, he brought to a place, dark place, uh, and tried to kill him. And some were shouting and uh, uh, tried to uh, hit with the knife. And some were there with the pointed sharp. Some were screaming. And there were so many people brought there to kill. And he was having fear. But at that time, he was memorizing Buddha, Buddha. So uh, at that point, uh, the people who were taking, uh, uh, telling, uh, he stays saying Buddha, see, so we have to let him go. Uh, so I think that uh, his next birth, I think he has uh, experienced. So uh, because of the Paritha chanting and saying Buddha, I think he has uh, done some pusala uh, at that point uh, so he has come back and so um, my question is uh, if he wants to develop his karma or he uh, pusala develop his, his kusala what kind of thing that he has to practice now because he is now very uh, he's, uh, he, at his 89 or uh, sorry 78 or like closer to 80 so in which way we can support him to come out from that bad situation? Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, well, I would encourage him to carry on with the Buddha recitation whenever he's free, strong enough to keep doing his meditation, and especially if he's got anxiety, fear, 
uh, negative states of mind or his health is going down, use Buddha. And I've heard this sort of experience that you just described many times before, people who have come back to their practice of meditation, developing mindfulness, recollecting Buddha at a time where they're very close to death and then they have a reprieve because their mind is in a good state and they um, last a lot longer than the doctors predicted and so on. You know, it's quite common. So it is important to try and keep our mind in a skillful state, to have a kusala state of mind as much as possible. And recitation of Buddha will help. Um, if he's 78, I think that's how old you said he was. Well, physically, he's probably fairly weak. So there may not be a lot he can do, but listening to the Dhamma may also help. I would recommend listening to Dhamma talks in a language that he understands and is comfortable with. Practicing the meditation to keep his mind in a wholesome state. Recollecting his past good deeds is another useful thing. So just keep keep up the, the, the Dhamma practice in whatever way he can at this stage will be very beneficial for him. And as a good friend, you could encourage him to do that. Sadhu Lampo, we have another raised digital hand. You may ask your question. Good evening, Ajahn. Uh, many thanks for your profound teachings. Um, I just wanted to know that even at the moment of anger, we do realize that we are angry and we do realize that it's not self which is angry. We do realize the other person is powerfully conditioned and that's where it's coming from. And these are possibly part of our karmas. And you do remember at times that it's like anger is like burning coal in your hand, carcass of dog around your neck and all of that stuff. But because the truth is not visceral or internalized, you know, you still uh, are burning and still, you know, so it's all more intellectual. So you know it's not self, but you obviously don't know. If you were to know it, you would not be reacting in that way. So how to uh, kind of internalize these teachings with more, just more practice. Uh, but obviously, we don't know when this is going to get right. But uh, I struggle with this, that the anger comes in and everything is there in the mind, even at the time of anger. But, you know, you're still reacting. So thank you, Ajahn. Uh, well, I think you know the answer, don't you? It's just more practice. We we when we get angry, if it's continuing, it keeps coming up, and it's keep, we keep developing that angry train of thought and the emotion. Then it's because of what we call unwise attention. We're looking at or thinking of the wrong thing. We're thinking of the thing that makes us angry, so it gets worse. So number one is bring up the mindfulness so you can pay attention to what's going on in that moment in your mind. And then, then and so using a, a mindfulness object regularly will help there, like the buddho or the using the breath. And then some wise attention as opposed to unwise attention. So any way of thinking that will help you to loosen the, the grip on that angry state of mind, the angry thoughts. So... If you're thinking of something you don't like and you're getting angry, well, try and think of something more skillful. If it's a person, you know, think of the good in that person or think of the, the the aspects of that person that are similar to you rather than just thinking of the the thing you don't like about them or what they said, what they've done that you didn't like or that hurt you. Uh, one very easy perception to bring up is with other people is think of them as like a relative they're just family. And if it's family, you tend to be able to forgive and let go more easily. So try and see everyone is like family. Um, obviously, cultivating thoughts of kindness, compassion, in whatever way you find works for you. That's something you have to explore and keep developing as an antidote to anger. It stops anger arising in the first place, or if anger arises, it helps you to let go of it. 
but you keep practicing. And the more mindfulness you, you practice and develop, the more it exposes the suffering of holding on to angry thoughts and angry emotional states. And then you quite naturally don't want to do that anymore. You want to drop them as quickly as possible, just like something that is super hot. You know, if you pick it up and it's hot, you want to drop it or put it down as quickly as possible. So it's the same kind of thing with your mind. It takes practice. Sadhu Lumpo, the next question. Dear Achan, could you please kindly explain what is the right way to adopt when one is listening to a Dhamma talk via Zoom meeting in this modern era? I will try to be mindful as you're listening. You can sit comfortably, but in a way that's going to promote mindfulness. So don't slouch too much or lie in bed if you can avoid, if it, unless you're ill. Try to sit up. Try to sit with mindfulness as you listen. So maybe mindfulness on the on the words you're hearing. Ajahn Chah used to say also, though, listen with your heart, meaning sometimes your mind becomes peaceful as you listen. And if it's going into a state of peace, calm, you start not hearing the words so much anymore, the meaning of the words, you're just going to that state of calm. Well, that's okay. If that's really what's happening and you're mindful and aware, you can do that. Um, other times that's not happening, so you just keep listening to the words. You know that some words you may not immediately remember or understand, some words you will. So you're trying to gain some understanding, you learn something, and then if you're listening with mindfulness, you'll tend to remember the words of the talk later as well, and they'll come up later, maybe tomorrow or the next day, and they may come up at different times to prompt your wisdom and your investigation of the Dhamma. So Dhamma talks, Dhamma teachings can come up over and over again when you listen to them with mindfulness. So the key is try to be mindful. Um, but if you go into a state of samadhi, that's okay. You just develop that samadhi for as long as you can. And I've had to do that. I've even had that experience when I've been translating and I've had to stop translating for a Dhamma talk because it was such a good talk. It put me straight in samadhi and then I couldn't remember anything that was said, but it didn't matter because I was very peaceful. And when you're peaceful, you don't feel embarrassed or shy. You're just peaceful. <laughs> Uh, so that can happen too. Sadhu Lumpo, the next question. Recently, I discovered that my sister has been physically abused by her husband. They have reconciled and moved on, but I am struggling to face my brother-in-law whenever I see him in a family gathering. What would be your advice? Yeah, it's a tough one. You have my sympathy as well, um, and your sister as well. Um, well, I guess you try to see, it depends on the situation, doesn't it? I don't really know the exact details of the situation, but you try to give people a chance, one chance. When it comes to physical violence, you know, there's not a lot of room for tolerance there. So, if it's already happened, you may try and give them a chance, but the support you'd give to the victim or the one who's who's been experienced the violence, um, I would recommend say, well, look, you have to draw a line and just say, if in the relationship any more violence and that's it, you can't live together because you've got to help protect that person. And if someone cannot control themselves, they can't control their temper and they will be violent again, that relationship is not a viable, I would say, probably not really a viable relationship. They should find a way to protect themselves and get out of it, if only temporarily get out. You know, you, you can only, with violence, you can only give one chance because there's too much danger involved, isn't it? It hurts and there could be serious consequences. So... I'd recommend them to not give repeated chances to the husband. You know, the you know, the wish is to have a good marriage. Maybe there's kids involved as well and keep everything together. And I know that's how often how people think. But 
violence is violence it's not really something you can tolerate and it tends if it keeps happening it tends to get worse more frequent it doesn't seem worth it better to get out of the situation so it can practice the dhamma in a more peaceful situation you know the buddha said better to be on your own than with someone who is hurting you so that's the general guideline but I, I, you know, I'm speaking generally here. I don't know the specific situation, so don't take this as specific advice yet. Maybe you have to go into the details more. But if somebody is repeatedly getting abused, that's not good. It has to change, it has to stop. Sadhu Lumpo, we have uh, another raised digital hand. You may ask your um, question. Thank you. Um, it's just uh, there's two bits I just wanted to clarify. Uh, hi, I'm calling. I'm Jonathan calling from uh, the UK. Uh, so good to see you. Um, is the Buddha meditation is it the in breath from the book and out breath on the dough? Uh, I think that's what I've been um described before. Or is it just letting the words resonate in the head, just without being attached to the breath? Or is it another way that you use the book? To... With, with meditation, there's a little bit of room for experiment here. So some teachers and some practitioners just recite Buddha alone, not with the breath. They're just reciting Buddha, 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 Buddha as a way to cut through thinking and distraction. And then some teachers, such as Ajahn Chah, suggest to try Buddha with the breath. So on the in breath, but on the out breath, to, but to, following the feeling of the breath and reciting Buddha. But there's a there's a room there's room for experimentation here. Some people will do counting, counting the breath in, breath out, one, one, two, two, up to ten, say. You can see what works for you. Maybe something has already worked for you and you can keep that going based on past experience, something that helped you to become more mindful, more calm. Or if you're very new, then just experiment a bit and see what seems to work for you, whether you prefer just the word itself or the word with the breath. So there's no one answer here, but the aim of meditation is to bring up mindfulness, to be able to pay attention to what you've set your mind to pay attention to. So to keep the breath in mind or to keep buddho in mind or to keep the breath with buddho in mind to pay attention to that keep it keep it there not to forget it that's the aim uh, so see what works for you and there's there's no absolute right or wrong here sadhu lumpo the next question dear lumpo I feel very sad about animals being killed for food. I feel them like young kids in their intellectual capacity rather than often kids. In my interactions, I saw they look up to us as guardians. I think we just act like animals and eat them rather than living up to our humanness. Any advice to help my sadness? Well, that's the world we live in, isn't it? And the world is a sad place on, on those levels. Um, human beings kill each other every day. Human beings kill animals. Animals kill each other every day. Um, that's, existence is bound up with these kind of sufferings. So I'd say the starting place, place would be try to take on the five precepts for yourself and undertake not to kill you, anything yourself, not to hurt or kill even little flies, insects, and so on. And just try and train with that. And at least you know you're, you as one person in the world are not killing and you're, you undertake not to kill. So you you give what we call Mahadana, the great gift of great safety to the world by undertaking the first precept. That means when you're also, when you're talking to other people, you may have a certain experience now. Oh, I don't kill and I haven't killed for a long time. So when you talk to others, so your words may have a certain weight to them, which might help. If you're 
encouraging other people to not kill. Um, but you also have to accept you can't change everybody's mind in this world. And what would be a, sh and you know, it's already sad that people are killing and being cruel to animals, say, but what would be also sad would be if you get very angry about what they're doing because sadness can go into anger very quickly. You know, the sadness of somebody with some insight into the dukkha characteristic, the characteristic of suffering is that they can see suffering, but they're not actually letting that suffering make their mind go into an unskillful state. And that's the, the where you need to apply mindfulness and wisdom to help yourself cope with the sadness of life. And you know, we all have to experience old age sickness and death. There's a lot of killing in the world. There's a lot of unpleasant behavior between people in the world. It is sad, but you don't want that sadness to be a cause for you to be angry, depressed, lost in your negative thoughts all the time. You want to try and maintain your mindfulness and equanimity towards all this and understand karma and you know, people who die, animals who die, they're receiving the fruits of karma. People who kill are making karma, bad karma, and so you have compassion for them. You, you would rather they didn't make that karma because you know it will come back to them. So try and reflect with mindfulness and wisdom. Keep your mind in a, a state of equanimity and peace as you reflect rather than let the sadness be a cause for you to become depressed or upset, angry. Yes, you know, the Buddha didn't say, teach us to become depressed or sad with the suffering of the world. He said, no suffering for what it is. But, but when you know it, it means you're mindful, you're aware, you have understanding rather than letting it condition your mind so you go into negative states. And there's a difference there. So you have to be clear on that through your practice. Sadhu Lumpur, the next question. Dear Achan, could you kindly guide us how to question the mind with regards to our beliefs of the body is me? It's the body as me. <laughs> Start simple. You know, it's, it's a big area even though your know, body you may be small size it's a big area of attachment um so start simple every day we lose hair from the head you know, when you have a shower you'll see hair in the bottom of the plug hole contemplate impermanence you know your hair drops off whether you like it or not it's not your hair it's in, not self it's impermanent it's ugly. You know, nobody likes to clean out plug holes. <laughs> so when you're cleaning out a plug hole with hair, your hair or other people's hair, contemplate all of this. Your body, you know, when you get um, a cut or some kind of blemish on your body, contemplate how your body is impermanent. It's, it's dukkha, it's subject to suffering, pain. It's not self. If you if it was a self, you would command it not to hurt, not to have an injury, not to have a cut, not to have a blemish or a bruise. But you can't do that. We try our best. We run to the doctor and get medication and treatment, of course. But it's impossible to avoid experiencing some pain, some discomfort, some problems with the body. It's dukkha. It's subject to decline. Doesn't stay pristine all the time. It's not self. You can't stop it going towards old age, sickness, and death. Reflect on this every day in very small, obvious ways first, in yourself, in the people around you, and gradually, as you become more mindful, more aware, you deepen that. And maybe one day when you, if you develop meditation every day, your mind becomes more peaceful, lets go of all the distractions, the hindrances. Then you can really focus on the body with very concentrated mindfulness and really separate mind from body and really see body as impermanent, not self. But it's a step-by-step -step process. So start with the small, easy things first. Sadhu Lumpur, we have a raised digital hand. 
you may ask your question. Is there anybody there? You can speak if you want to speak. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Next question. Is listening to a Dhamma talk or attending a Dhamma talk just to have a feeling of peace or is it to listen to the teachings and reflect on the Dhamma? Both. <laughs> just depends doesn't it you know sometimes just a feeling of peace is already good enough if you're stressed and this you hear some dhamma that calms you down that's that's a victory that's good but of course a dhamma talk is also to explain things point you in the direction of the dhamma lead your reflection remind you of things give you deeper explanation of things you may already understand on one level but maybe give you a new insight a deeper insight yeah, you know, there's many benefits from the Dhamma, but they go hand in hand. It can be both the feeling and some intellectual understanding arises from the Dhamma talk. They're both good. And uh, sometimes it's one more than the other, but they're both good. Sadhu Lumpo, the next question. Dear Achan, I've heard that path moment happens when the mind has all eight factors of the noble eightfold path coming together. Could you kindly explain about it? <laughs> oh, the whole of the noble eightfold path. <laughs> One question. Well, you obviously know what the noble eightfold path factors are. You know, you can read them, read the suttas, read the explanations. And the main point is like the spokes of a wheel. They, for the wheel to turn, all the spokes have to be in place. Otherwise, the wheel will not turn. You know, if there's a spoke missing, it will clunk or it just won't turn. So you need all these eight factors developing together and they support each other. So it's, they're not like contradictory. They're actually parts of the same thing. But on paper, we separate them out. But they need to be developed together. You can't miss one out. That's the, probably the most important thing to know is that you, you have to develop all eight factors. And sometimes, you know, uh, some people are more heavy on the samatha, on the samadhi, and less on the vipassana and the insight. Some people um, like to do their meditation, but they don't keep precepts. Some people like to read the Dhamma and develop a lot of intellectual understanding or right view, but they don't meditate much. So you have to investigate where your practice of the Eightfold Path is, is sometimes imbalanced or what's lacking. And you have to look at the overall result of your practice. Is it leading you to reduce and abandon mental defilements of greed, anger, and delusion? Or are the mental defilements still there? Or are they getting worse? That would, be, that would be that would be a cause for concern. If you're getting more angry, more greedy, more deluded, more confused, more, suffering more, then you know, your practice of the path, something's not right. The aim of the path is to wear away, reduce defilement little by little, and thereby reduce your suffering. And that's the whole pur purpose of it. So that's your guideline on, on whether you're, you're developing these path factors or not. Sadhu Lumpo, we have a raised digital hand. You may ask your question. Paying respect, Leung Po. Um, greetings from Leeds. I'm in England. So uh, the question is, when I was a child, my kindness and generosity were spontaneous and without any thoughts. It was like a second nature to me uh, without realizing it. But however, since I learned, I've been learning Dharma, I struggle with the thoughts of making merits, you know, because it's been... Uh, 
uh, sort of reiterated making merits and learning about the highest blessings for giving uh, in dana and other things. And these thoughts keep creeping in. I feel it's not, con well, it's, I feel that my giving should be unconditional and pure. I, however, at this moment in time, the thoughts keep coming in. Oh, I must make merit or something like that. I'm just wondering how do I deal with these feelings as I don't find them very comfortable and I try to not get attached to them, but they keep on coming in. So please, uh, Long Po, can you advise? Yeah, it's a good point. And sometimes the um, way Buddhists talk about Dhamma practice or talk to each other, sometimes we do reinforce um, subtle attachment, subtle identification with various concepts like merit. Sometimes we don't fully understand the concept, or even when we understand it, you know, we 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 just following the discussions and the things we've heard, the cultural conditioning and the surrounding Buddhist communities conditioning, we may sometimes feel pressured or just follow out of habits. And like you say, sometimes we also think too much about stuff. Sometimes we have to get back more to being like the child who just gives spontaneously. But of course, some wise reflection directed to the practice of dana and giving is not a bad thing either so as you get older because of experience well you may sometimes be a little bit more um refined and more aware of giving and what's your useful way to give and where you find you gain happiness in giving because that's how the buddha said to practice giving is give in to causes or to give in a way that will make you happy that's the part, purpose of it because there's so many ways you can give as a human being, different causes, different, you know, even just say supporting Sangha, which is only one way of giving, but there's many different things you can give to Sangha. You can give, um, you know, food or you can give robes or you can give knowledge, you can give medicine, you can give a lift to a monk or you can give all kinds of different things to Sangha and you have to get to know yourself. What are you happy to give what you can give? You know, what is within your means? What is your within your ability? And what do you feel happy to, to give? And that applies to any kind of dana, whether it's you know, helping the poor or helping the sick or helping animals or giving to this charity or that charity or just helping certain people. You're, you're trying to give in a skillful way. So if you also practice meditation, that will help because then you'll become aware maybe of where some of your attachments are and you can use the understanding you get from watching your mind, observing your mind in meditation to help guide your giving so that is a, it's an effective way of helping you to loosen some of your attachments. So that may mean sometimes just giving when you don't want to give. You notice you're in a bad mood and you're feeling really stingy or angry and you don't want to help anyone, but you make yourself help when you're in that kind of mood or you may notice sometimes you're really attached to something you don't want to give it up you don't want to think about giving away or giving sharing something that you really like but you realize that attachment is there as you meditate and so you decide oh i should really give this away or you know sometimes give this thing that i'm really attached to away so the development of mindfulness and insight in meditation will support your dana, and your dana will support your development of meditation. And your aim is just to get you know to the point maybe where giving is a very natural quality, like you say, spontaneous natural quality. But it doesn't mean to say you have to give everything away you own. It just means you have the thought to give. And if someone comes along and asks for help or there's an opportunity to give and it presents itself to you, you can give fairly naturally, fairly easily because you've trained to that point. That may be a goal you might aim for in giving, is just to be able to give without a lot of thought, but just to know what is something useful to give. It makes me happy. 
and an opportunity has come along. You don't even have to look for the opportunity. It just presents itself and then you can give. So I, I would practice some meditation and then reflect back on your giving and you'll learn that way, I think. Sadhu Lampo, the next question. How can one deal with compulsive mind states that can seem to take over? I feel like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, example, an inner teenager state that procrastinates and doesn't want to do a tax return and who takes uh, over when bedtime approaches persistently wants to stay up late binging on online videos <laughs> and doesn't care this makes one so tired for work the next day and interferes with right livelihood. This unwholesome mind state has taken me over for several decades now. So any guidance would be much appreciated. Thank you. Well, practically speaking, if you've recognized what the problem is and you realize it is a problem, you're wasting a lot of time and energy on frivolous, unimportant things and missing out on a chance to develop deeper mindfulness and insight through meditation and also getting enough sleep. Once you've known, recognized the problem, you have to start developing some discipline, personal discipline. You can make resolutions. Aditana Barami, you might say, I am going to turn my uh, equipment off, whether it's tablet, iPad, phone, whatever, at certain times, and I'm just going to get into the habit of doing that. And you teach yourself to follow whatever rules you've set yourself, whether it's late at night, early in the morning, middle of the day. You have to identify the problem with your particular weakness or addiction and then introduce some rules and practices that will help you deal with it so, so you don't waste your whole life, let your whole life just fritter away without developing the path of practice for following the Buddha. So you have to see where where you can introduce a bit of discipline, particularly around videos or whatever it is your, your particular addiction is. And your aim is to get more self-control so that you're more in control whether you watch these things or not. You have that mindfulness and awareness to choose rather than being a slave to the technology and the videos or whatever it is. So make some resolutions, make some plans and strategies, make, get the discipline up and try and put that into place before it's too late and you're old and then you die. Sadhu Lumpo, does anyone have any further questions? Lumpo, there are no further questions. Okay, it's been a long session today. I guess that's because we haven't met for a while, but um, we wish you well with your practice. Uh, happy New Year to anyone we didn't wish a Happy New Year to, and we'll see you next time.